Hello, and welcome to another edition of Day Drinking with Kevin. I'm your host, Kevin McGuire, and today's episode is all about collecting and storing wine. Our special guest is Michael Kelly, owner and proprietor of California Wines and Wineries website and blog. Michael has an incredible passion for wine and all things wine related. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I know that the Day Drinking with Kevin listeners out there are going to be very interested in what you have to say. So I really appreciate your time. Michael, uh, one of the questions I get quite a bit is, I like wine, I'd like to start collecting wine, but I'm not sure which types of wine will age for a while and which ones don't. What do you tell people that are just looking to start a wine collection? So I think that the key thing, Kevin, and thanks for uh, inviting me on today to your show. I think that there's a couple of things that are very important. One is, what is your goal in mm -hmm. trying to collect wine? I mean, that's, that's number one. Number two, most wines are made 98% of all wines are consumed within three or four days of purchase. Okay. So not that many people really collect wines. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, okay, if I'm going to maybe buy some nicer higher end wines and I want them to age and mature and perhaps uh, come and open up to be even better than they are today, what kinds of wine should I take or should I buy and, and do this? But then the, then the follow on question of that is then how do I store them correctly? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two parts to that. So let me just start with the first part of it, which is um, when you do buy collectible wines, they should be well known. You read the winemakers notes at first, you say most of the wines that, come from the higher end wineries in Napa, for example, will state uh, ageable for 10 to 25 years. Okay, mm -hmm. so you say, well, that's interesting. Now, I've got at least that parameter taken care of. Now, how do I go about storing those? Well, you know, you've got to have a dark location because mm -hmm. sunlight will permeate the bottle and destroy the wine. Mm -hmm. The second is that it needs to be a constant temperature and ideally as a cave, uh, 55 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so you can buy everything from little wine cabinets to credenza wine cabinets that have a condenser in them. But the, one of the worst things people do is they go down to the local Costco or something and buy a little refrigerator, wine refrigerator that holds 30, 15 to 30, 50 bottles. And then they, they age it for a year or two, three, and they come back and go, well, this is no good. Well, the reason for that is humidity. A refrigerator actually takes the humidity out of, of that kind of, that's a, that's a refrigerator, not a condenser. A condenser then puts in humidity and you want to keep your humidity between 50 and 70% in that, whether it's a cabinet or a cellar. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing is that you want to make sure that you minimize the amount of movement with the wine, not so that once you have a system, whether it's in a cabinet or it's in a cellar, you're not constantly moving wine around saying, oh, gee, I got now I've, if you're, let's say you're um, storing it by alphabet mm -hmm. and you now you get a new one called with starts a uh, David wine and you go, oh, I got my D's are mixed up. So you put uh, that you need to get a software program so that it can be randomly put into the cellar mm -hmm. and not necessarily by alphabet or by varietal. So you're not moving and jostling the bottles and just let them sit there and gracefully sleep. When my wife and I started, we had the gracious idea of, of starting with California and then going to you know, Oregon and Washington state and then the rest of the U S and then France and Germany and Spain and Italy. And that worked well for a while. But then after a while, when we started drinking the wines, we realized this isn't going to work anymore. And so we rely on cellar tracker, for example, to, uh, to tell us where every bottle is. And, um, some of the original bottles are where they, they started off, but now new bottles that come in, they just go in whatever open slot we have. And that's, uh, that's a, now there are a couple of types of wines that, 
are intended for long-term storage, probably ones with um, high tannins, high sugar content, that kind of thing. And then there are wines that aren't intended to be aged at all. Um, what kinds of wines, if somebody were building a collection, should they look for when starting for, for, for long-term storage? Yeah, so one, it's, it's um, you want to have wines that have, that will be able to have the fruit continue to develop. Mm -hmm. You want uh, the tannins to be high. You want the uh, pH level to be 3.71 and higher, typically, and mm -hmm. that will age out your wines. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question is, when you say what kinds of wines, you so there are certain wines that you would you want to age correctly. Mm -hmm. and that's Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, for the higher ends, Riojas from Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, Carmenere's from Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, you can do uh, Barolos from um, from Italy. I mean, there's just a different thing. You can even do some very high end Chardonnays, such mm -hmm. as Peter Michael. Um, mm. Obviously, your French Chardonnays, uh, your um, Maritana Chardonnays from Napa, or Sonoma, uh, mm -hmm. Russian River type Pinots. The same thing, you, but uh, so, but you have to understand that grape varietal to understand their life cycle. So a funny one is Roussan. Mm -hmm. Roussan, when you buy Roussan, it's great for the first two or three years, and then it goes dormant for about three or four years. In other words, the level of is way up here in terms of quality for the first couple of years. Then it goes down, and it's just it's just the property of the grape for four, three to four or five years, and then it comes right back up to that same level again. So mm. a Roussan, you want to drink either fairly quickly or you just put it in the back of the cellar and let it sit and then drink it later on down the road. But mm -hmm. so you have to understand the nature of the grape itself. But they, Roussan is one of those funny grapes that goes dormant in the bottle and then comes back and then springs back to life. That's a really interesting story. Um, there are a couple of different approaches when starting cellars. One is to go out and spend a fortune and buy all the, the wines at once. Um, or the other one is to maybe carefully choose what you're um, collecting, maybe based on preferences, based on wineries that you like, uh, trips you've been on, those kind of things. Is there a particular strategy you recommend to your customers with regards to how to collect wines? Yes, so I'll give you a bad example, which is me. Okay. And then I'll give you a good example, which is me. Okay. <laughs> So at first, uh, we when I started collecting wines, I was traveling for a job around the world. And so I purposely tried to collect wines from China, India, mm -hmm. every country in Europe, South America, Asia, and I and you know, all over China. And so the end result was we ended up with a tremendous amount of wine. Mm -hmm. And we as and then as our palates grew over the years, those wines we decided we're horrible. So it was mm. really nice to say you had a bottle from India or a bottle from China, or you mm. had a bottle from Brazil or Argentina, but in the end, they were not drinkable or they didn't meet our palate taste at the time. So before, I think one of the things about collecting wine is that you want to have a time period so that your wine drinking and your taste have matured to a level that you feel somewhat um, uh, comfortable with and is solidified. Not, not that you have can't buy other things, but we simply got rid of a lot of that wine. We threw parties and just poured wine crazy. And so we got rid of all this wine. And I said to my wife, she goes, yeah, I don't like a lot of this wine. And I said, yeah, some of it's not very good. So let's start over again. Let's start this collecting once again. So we did a reset about oh, 15, 16 years ago after two years of having crazy parties at our house and we simply washed the, the wines out with, with, at these events. And we simply said, okay, what is it? So my wife really likes Chardonnay, mm -hmm. uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc mm -hmm. and Rioja. Okay. So, so those four are like the cornerstone of the cellar meaning those are our four pillar wines that we, that we work around. Now, beyond that, 
I have a book here of something like uh, probably 50 varietals that I have in the cellar today, but mm -hmm. I don't go in depth on those. So like Carmenere, I'm a big collector of Carmenere, mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the lost varietals of Bordeaux. So I still collect uh, Carmenere from the United States and from Argentina, mm -hmm. um, Chile or Chile. Mm -hmm. And then what I try to do, but I don't store hundreds and hundreds. I just buy, you know, five here, three there, seven here. And that allows some variety in your tasting because we literally drink a bottle of wine a day with mm -hmm. our food. And we usually drink one glass of wine with the food and we drink another glass after dinner without food. Okay. And so depending on what is being served that evening for, for the, for dinner or sometimes even a lunch, we'll go ahead and pair the, the wine with the food. And so there's always enough with 50 varietals, there's enough in there and it's probably more than 50, but there's always enough in the cellar to say, okay, we're having a, a Portuguese uh, a sausage night with pasta, or we're having a, a ribeye steak, or we're having a, a shrimp, uh, um, how, what do you pair with it? You can always grab a bottle or two very simply. And then, and wine pairing and food pairing is a whole, just a fun thing to do and experiment and try. Don't listen to what people say you should pair things with, just go for it. And you'll have failures and you'll have positive things. But back to the basic question, you need to, don't try to go after everything because one, you'll run out of room in your house. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, there's only a limited amount of space that you typically have to store your wine. And whether that's a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, you're not going to want to have that much more relative to how much time it requires to maintain, categorize um, ins and outs every every time it, it, it becomes you don't want it to become work. You want it to be enjoyable. And one other just as a footnote to collecting, collecting is not to collect for collecting's sake, meaning you don't collect it so that you have um, an investment per se. Wine is meant to be enjoyed with your with your family and friends. Absolutely. And so if you just are a collector, you might as well collect cars or stamps or coins or you know some other thing. But if but wine is something to be shared, not to be hoarded and guarded closely. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, in in our personal collection style, we're, we're fortunate enough to to travel and, and take different trips. And a lot of the bottles behind me are representative of those trips. Either uh, when we come out to Napa, you know, there's a, a bottle of Stag's Leap Fay over here or Pine Ridge or Dariush, you know, places that we've been. Um, or uh, on, on this side is, is, is Italy. And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate enough pre-pandemic to uh, to travel to Italy and so I like remembering the bottles because it always brings up a story of uh, where we were when we were enjoying that bottle and, you know let's face it um, you know when people come into the restaurant and talk to me or I'm sure you, you get the same thing um, they always have a story about that particular place or that bottle or that magical event that happened around wine and, and for me, that's what collecting wine is all about. It's being able to relive those, those memories with family and friends. Well, and I think uh, that's exactly the point. I think the, during this pandemic, uh, what has been helpful, at least for me and my wife, was to go into the cellar, pull a bottle of wine out, whether it was from in, uh, Italy, for example, and uh, uh, up in the uh, uh, Barbaresco area or or it was something down in Tuscany, or it was something over in a uh, champagne bottle from, from uh, outside of Paris and the Champagne District, Rems. Mm -hmm. You could pull a bottle and you got to travel in your mind mm -hmm. and re recount these experiences without looking at the same four walls sitting inside your house all day. Mm -hmm. And that made a big difference, I thought, uh, just as a side note again. I agree. Michael, everybody that I've met in the wine industry has a particular moment that got them into wine, um, it, a magical bottle, a magical story. What got you into this profession? Well, so it's not a profession, it's an avocation, okay? Sure. So, uh, 
uh, I was in high tech uh, semiconductor business for for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And but I always was interested in wine and how I got real. I mean, I kind of dabbled drinking some very unusual, uh, very usual and typical table wines along the way. And then uh, one year in 1978, mm -hmm. uh, we went up to Napa. My wife and I went up there. We were just recently married, went up to Napa and uh, walked in and did a tasting uh, with this gentleman named Robert Mandavi at the time. I've heard of him. Yeah. yeah, you've heard of him. <laughs> and so, so he was very cordial and just friendly. And he said, listen, I want you to taste my private Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, and wow. you, you, you will like this. Well, we fell in love with the winery. We fell in love with him. And we bought our first case of wine, a 1974 Cabernet Sauvignon. And had no idea how I was going to even pay for it at the time. Just, mm -hmm. but we bought a case and this is before credit cards. This was mm. either, you either had to do it on American express or write a check. Okay. We put it on American express and we walked out of there and I can't even remember what we paid for it, but it was, <laughs> we didn't, it was more than our house payment at the time. And we wow. thought this was crazy. We, you know, my wife goes, this is at us. I still have one bottle in the cellar today and that will not be, that's just for the memory of that, going back to our previous discussion. That mm -hmm. just brings this whole wave of emotion and the experience and how it started. And I say that was the key impetus for um, wine. And then after that, we used to take one or two weeks every year and go wine tasting all around the, uh, Northern California. And then subsequently later, when I was doing worldwide sales, we traveled all over the world and spent extra days in different locations, tasting, tasting and buying wines. Fantastic. And I'm guessing these trips around California uh, to the wineries and all of these experiences is where California wine and wineries got started. The idea for your website. Yes. Yeah, so after I retired from business and I was in the process of writing a book, and was getting writer's, cramp, uh, writer's block, and a good friend of mine who's published a few books, I asked her how she got through this writer's block. And she said, just start writing about something you know every day, start a blog. I didn't even know what a blog was mm -hmm. eight years ago, eight and nine years ago. I didn't even know what a blog was. Well, sure enough, uh, I said, she goes, what do you know? I said, well, I know semiconductors. The industry, the high tech industry. I know golf. You can see the golf balls in the background there. Uh, do a lot of golfing. And I said, I know wine. She says, Well, pick one of those and start a blog and just write every day. And it's like a muscle. You and you'll research and you'll taste or, or experience or whatever, and you'll be able to communicate that in a in a daily basis. And so I chose wine and. Uh, and eight years later, I'm, uh, you know, I post and get hundreds of thousands of people and uh, with various websites and guests, guests and social media then has expanded and continued on. Um, I get an opportunity to talk about wine I became a wine judge. I export wine to Japan. Um, I'm involved uh, doing some personal services for people buying wines. It just goes on and on. So it's kind of just gate. It, as I as I told my wife, it keeps me jo from joining gangs in California, doing this wine business. You know, for my day drinkers out there, one of the things that I have done for many years is followed Michael on the internet and read his blogs and his stories and uh, just kind of experienced Michael's passion of wine through his writing. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted him to, to join us today to, to talk about wine, because um, I highly recommend that everybody go to California Wines and Wineries, and I'll put the website at the bottom there, um, and, and read uh, some of the things that Michael has put together about wine. And you'll see firsthand the, the, the passion and enthusiasm that he has uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this wonderful world of wine. Uh, Michael, there's no question that um, 2020 was hard for everyone. Um, and a global pandemic, uh, fires in the Napa and uh, Sedoma areas and uh, a variety of other things. Have you seen 
anything uh, changing uh, with regards to how uh, the new normal will be when they're traveling to wineries, um, say in Napa and Sonoma in the future? Well, so I was just talking to a uh, director of uh, wine education yesterday in Napa. Mm -hmm. And they got, today is the first day, just happens to be today, uh -huh. they got the next level. We California has this color coding system, uh -huh. and it starts out at purple, goes to red, and the yellow. They went yellow yesterday in Napa Valley. Oh, fantastic. So they can now do 50% capacity of indoor wine tasting. Uh -huh. So today's like, there's fireworks going off at midnight last night in Napa, I'm sure, except wow. for they don't want to start a fire. Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, they're very excited about today being day one. And so I'm actually going up next week for the first time in 12 or 13 months, which is the longest I've ever gone without being in Napa. Mm -hmm. Now I have gone to some, we live kind of in the Sierra foothills. So I have a couple, I've gone to a couple of places here in the Sierra foothills. Mm -hmm. But it's we're about ready in California to make the transition. Uh, this county just happens still to be in the red tier. So it's still outdoor tasting and at 25 percent. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no one get involved with the color coding system that they have out here. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think what happened during the last year was everybody went into the Zoom meetings, which I call the talking heads. Now I'm one of the talking heads. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, you try to do virtual tastings with people buying the wine in advance, doing the tasting, having an opportunity to talk about it. And depending on the size of the audience and whether you're doing education or you're doing wine tasting, um, it's, it's a still a difficult task doing it remotely and over because you don't you can't you don't experience the nose, you don't experience the color the same, you don't experience obviously the taste, so the finish. So it's a tough, it's a really tough proposition, but most of the smaller wineries have survived quite nicely. The ones that have had more of a struggle were the ones who had, were, had national distribution and had the three tier system uh, because all the restaurants were shut down. So they couldn't get their wines out the bigger ones had to discount their wines in order to get the same, to hold the same volume. The smaller mm -hmm. guys had these creative programs and uh, what I call customer profiles to engage with the customer. And I've actually done some software with working some software with one winery, trying mm -hmm. to get them to um, engage the customer and have a knowledge base of their customer so that if they happen to be, I know you're, uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll make myself the example of San Francisco 49er fan. Mm -hmm. So when the first season comes or the first game comes out, um, you go to something like uh, the people who had an interest in football and mm -hmm. say, hey, this weekend we're going to have off their database, we're going to have a opportunity to kick off the NFL season. And we're going to go with, uh, uh, doesn't matter, but our winery is going to give you a, 15% discount for this on Saturday. So you can watch the game Sunday afternoon, enjoying a glass of Chardonnay, for example. And that would be kind of the, the thing that has changed. I think that the three tier system was out of balance. Mm -hmm. um, the fires and the pandemic and not being able to visit wineries was out of balance. And so that the creative people have been able to sustain their business through the pandemic, uh, and I think you'll see they'll res they'll respond quicker and faster than the bigger guys. I was um, talking to um, one of the family members of a family-owned winery up uh, Highway 29 on the right-hand side there um, in the Oak Knoll district, um, and um, you know he was telling me that. One side benefit of the pandemic, if you will, uh, is that although they couldn't produce as much wine because of the fires and the smoke taint on the grapes and things like that, um, that they actually had more wine left over from previous years because they hadn't been able to sell it through the, the tasting rooms and through their distribution channels. 
So they're able to do more unique things with the wine uh, from previous uh, vintages uh, to see what will happen. And so longer barrel aging and other things. Um, and it's actually that stock of wine that will uh, enable them to get through um, what will probably not be a very large 2020 harvest. Um, yeah. yeah, the 2020 harvest, you know, I was talking, uh, by the way, I, I also put on a national Cabernet Franc wine competition every year. And, wow. uh, and so this year we had, I think, 14 or 17 states participate in it. Uh -huh. uh, and it's here right in this little complex that I live in that we put the event on. And um, this year, and then we're hoping to go international this, this December. Uh -huh. And one of the things that is this, I was talking to people on the East Coast and the Midwest, and they were getting grapes. And they said, oh, we're getting all these great grapes from California. This isn't like in uh, November, December timeframe from California. And I said, man, make sure you test it. Because... Yeah. Most of the people dropped the good wineries dropped in my dropped their fruit unless it was an early harvest. Mm -hmm. They dropped their fruit and just said, we're not even going to bother with it this year. We'll just use it for fertilizer. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about the Cabernet Franc competition and Michael Cabernet Franc is one of my favorite grapes of all time. Um, and so um, I hope you'll keep me on your mailing list for when the next competition uh, comes, because um, I believe that uh, whether it be from Shinong or uh, from the North Fork of Long Island, where they make some wonderful Cabernet Francs to here in Virginia, uh, there's one particular winery that I think makes some amazing Cab Franc. Um, I would uh, I would very much uh, like to uh, to taste uh, some of the selections that uh, people are sending you for your competition. Was was that Narmada? It was Narmada, as a matter of fact. Yes, <laughs> they, they had, see it. So they actually joined the competition and got some very nice awards. Um, and I wrote a couple of articles, or at least one article on them on on their Cab Franc. And I was blown away how good the Cab Franc was from Virginia. Yeah, they they do have a particular pride in their in their Cabernet Franc and their Reserve Cabernet Franc. And I, I've talked to both the uh, the owner and the winemaker there, and their eyes light up when you talk about Cabernet Franc. And um, I think ultimately right now, Virginia State Grape is Viognier, but I'm pretty sure it's just that because it starts with a B. Um, I believe that uh, that Cabernet Franc will ultimately be one of the state grapes of Virginia in the future because I think we have the right soil, climate, and, and everything to, to grow some amazing wines. And I heard the same thing from a sommelier uh, recently about Virginia being with the, the waterways and cooling it down and blah, 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 that, it was a, that soil was definitely uh, desirable for Cab Franc. So, uh, Absolutely. And so this year, I haven't set the date yet, but it's always... National, the National Cab Franc Day is December 4th. So I usually try to hold it one, two, or three days ahead of that so that I put the results of the Cabernet wine competition out just on or the day before National Cab Franc Day, which is December 4th every year. Fantastic. Well, day drinkers out there on December 4th, we'll be having a special uh, episode on Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Franc Day, and maybe Michael will allow us to release the re results uh, to you because um, for those of you who think Cab Franc is just a blending grape in Bordeaux, uh, think again, it is a wonderful grape uh, that makes some tremendous single varietal wines as well. Michael, thank you so much uh, for taking the time uh, to speak with me today. And um, I'm encouraging all of those day drinkers out there to uh, visit Michael's website at uh, California Wines and Wineries um, and read some of these tremendous uh, blogs and features that uh, he has done on food and wine and, and wineries. Um, is there anything else that you would like to tell our day drinkers before we close today? Uh, no, I think that the key thing is that after you, after you have your collection and you do a sorting of it, you have a re record and you can sort of sort it by varietal. You can sort it by when's the time to drink it. And I always guard band it a little bit. So if mm -hmm. the winery says it's good for 15 years uh, and you buy six bottles of that wine, drink it after five years, drink it after eight years, drink it at 12 years. 
And mm -hmm. at some point along the way, you'll say, I don't think this it's going on the it's on this down slope. Pull it in. And that's why it's nice to have a computer system. You pull it in and then it comes up on your to drink list right away. And that way you don't end up with a problem having some bad wine. Like I, had, I went to a friend's house the other day. He had some uh, 1992 Moet and Chardon and mm -hmm. it wasn't stored correctly. And uh, when you popped the cork, it went and that was it and no bubbles. And, you know, yeah. it, it was a $200 <laughs> bottle of uh, champagne. And he since has learned his lesson and has now put all the wine in a nice cabinet that I ended up selling to him when I put my wine cellar in. So he's good to go. One of the things that I recommend to my customers is a, a Corvin system. Um, so that if they don't want to open up an entire bottle of wine to taste to see how it's progressing, that they could at least, um, you know, try a sample of some of their wines. Uh, is that something that, that uh, you, you, ask, you know, tell people is a good idea as well? Uh, no, I just simply get on the phone and tell people to come on over if there's any wine left over. And I have a lot of <laughs> a lot of friends and they come over and finish the bottle. Uh, I bought a Corvan uh, when they first came out. I used it one time and I don't know how long they've been in existence. Probably what, 15 years, 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. I've used it one time and okay. I haven't used it since. I mean, uh, that's the whole thing that you share the wine with people. And so if I open a bottle and it's a good bottle, it's within our community. It's a kind of a golf course, golf cart community. You just mm -hmm. call someone. So they drive over their golf cart, form a glass, sit around, talk, and they leave. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I tell you where, where I used my, my Corbin the most is when I was studying for one wine certification or another, and I'd have like 12 or 14 bottles I was tasting at one time. Uh, I have a lot of friends, but even that was uh, pushing uh, pushing the limit a little bit. So uh, I used it a lot for at, at that point. But you're I, right. I think, yeah, and I've heard that from a sev several other folks that when 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 you go through the through the various W said or some tastings, uh, and mm -hmm. you're trying to taste and differentiate a French Chardonnay from an American Chardonnay or you know Pinot, blah blah blah. It's a really important thing to just have a little bit of each of those to get the differentiation in there and know what it is that you're smelling, tasting and enjoying. But uh, uh, we're not to the, we're just enjoying the wine as they say. And uh, I wanna thank you for letting me come on today. Uh, it was nice, it's great to meet you virtually mm -hmm. over the, uh, uh, the Zoom meeting here today. And hopefully you're, uh, I'll start uh, following all your, I went back and read uh, and read or listened to several of the, uh, um, the the previous episodes you have done with a few folks, and mm -hmm. I enjoyed them, and I will uh, follow you uh, going forward every time. Well, Michael, thank you very, very much. And again, as a reminder, day drinkers, please uh, follow Michael at California Wines and Wineries. Um, and um, Michael, good luck to you, and uh, stay safe out there in California, and Next time I'm in the area, I look forward to uh, coming to see this golf course community and, uh, and raising a glass with you, sir, and thanking you for, uh, for your time today. My wine cellar is always open to you, Kevin. Thank you. Very good, sir. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to our day drinkers out there. And please visit Michael's website at CaliforniaWinesAndWineries.com. If you like this episode, please don't hesitate to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Day Drinking with Kevin. And if you have ideas for future episodes, email me at daydrinkingwithkevin at gmail.com. Until next time, I say salute.